The Dutch resistance to the Nazi occupation of the Netherlands during World War II can be mainly characterized as non-violent, and was organized by the Communist Party, churches, and independent groups. A peak of over 300,000 people were hidden from German authorities in the autumn of 1944, tended to by some 60,000 to 200,000 illegal landlords and caretakers, and tolerated knowingly by some one million people, including a few incidental individuals among German occupiers and military. Dutch resistance developed relatively slowly, but the event of the February strike and its cause, the random police harassment and deportation of over 400 Jews, greatly stimulated resistance. The first to organize themselves were the Dutch communists, who set up a cell system immediately. Some other very amateurish groups also emerged, notably de Guzen, set up by Bernardus Ijazerdraat, as well as some military-styled groups, such as the Order Service Dutch, Orderdienst. Most had great trouble surviving betrayal in the first two years of the war. Dutch counterintelligence, domestic sabotage, and communications networks eventually provided key support to Allied forces, beginning in 1944 and continuing until the Netherlands was fully liberated. Some 75% out of, of the Jewish population perished in the Holocaust, most of whom were murdered in Nazi death camps. A number of resistance groups specialized in saving Jewish children, including the Utrecht Sea Kinderkomite, Landelijke Organisatie voor Hulp aan Onderdijkers, Namlo's Venutschap (NV), and Amsterdam Student Group. The Columbia Guide to the Holocaust estimates that 215 to 500 Dutch Romanis were killed by the Nazis, with the higher figure estimated as almost the entire pre-war population of Dutch Romanis. Topic definition. The Dutch themselves, especially their official war historian Dr. Loé de Jong, director of the State Institute for War Documentation also known as NIAD, distinguished among several types of resistance. Going into hiding, at which the Dutch appeared to excel, was generally not categorized by the Dutch as resistance because of the passive nature of such an act, helping these so-called underdikers was, but more or less reluctantly so. Non-compliance with German rules, wishes or commands, or German condoned Dutch rule, was also not considered resistance. According to official publications, sabotage on an extensive scale must have appeared at those companies in the Netherlands that kept on working during the war collaboration was rife in the country, but until recently this was not seen as resistance. Public protests by individuals, political parties, newspapers, or churches were also not considered to be resistance. Publishing illegal papers, something the Dutch were very good at, with some 1,100 separate titles appearing, some reaching circulations of more than 100,000 for a population of 8.5 million, was not considered resistance per se. Only active resistance in the form of spying, sabotage, or with arms was what the Dutch considered resistance. Nevertheless, thousands of members of all the non-resisting categories were arrested by the Germans and often subsequently jailed for months, tortured, sent to concentration camps, or killed. Up until the 21st century, the tendency existed in Dutch historical research and publications to not regard passive resistance as real resistance. Slowly, this has started to change, also because of the emphasis the RIOD has been putting on individual heroism since 2005. The unique Dutch February strike of 1941, protesting the deportation of Jews from the Netherlands, the only such strike to ever occur in Nazi-occupied Europe, is usually not defined as resistance by the Dutch. The strikers, who numbered in the tens of thousands, are not considered resistance participants. The Dutch generally prefer to use the term illegalitet for all those activities that were illegal, contrary, underground, or unarmed. After the war, the Dutch created and awarded a resistance cross not to be confused with the much lower-ranking verzetscherdenkingskruis to only 95 people, of whom only one was still alive when receiving the decoration, a number in stark contrast to the hundreds of thousands of Dutch men and women who performed illegal tasks at any moment during the war. Topic. Prelude Prior to the German invasion, the Netherlands had adhered to a policy of strict neutrality. The country had narrow bonds with Germany, and less so with the British. The Dutch had not engaged in war with any European nation since 1830. During World War I, the Dutch were not invaded by Germany and anti-German sentiment was not as strong after that war as it was in other European countries. 
The German ex-Kaiser had fled to the Netherlands in 1918 and lived there in exile. The German invasion, therefore, came as a great shock to many Dutch people. Nevertheless, the country had ordered general mobilization in September 1939. By November 1938, during the Kristallnacht, many Dutch people received a foretaste of things to come. German synagogues could be seen burning, even from the Netherlands, such as the one in Aachen. An anti fascist movement started to gain popularity, as did the fascist movement, notably the National Socialistische Bewegung. Despite strict neutrality, which implied shooting down British as well as German planes crossing the border into the Netherlands, the country's large merchant fleet was severely attacked by the Germans after 1 September 1939, the beginning of World War II. The sinking of the passenger liner SS Simone Bolivar in November 1939, with 84 dead, especially shocked the nation. It was not the only vessel. German invasion. On 10 May 1940, German troops started their surprise attack on the Netherlands without a declaration of war. The day before, small groups of German troops wearing Dutch uniforms had entered the country. Many of them wore Dutch helmets, some made of cardboard as there were not enough originals. The Germans deployed about 750,000 men, three times the strength of the Dutch army, some 1,100 planes Dutch Army Air Service, 125, and six armoured trains. They destroyed 80% of the Dutch military aircraft on the ground in one morning, mostly by bombing. The Dutch Army, a so-called cadre militia consisting of professional officers and conscript NCOs and ranks, was inferior to the German Army in many respects, it was poorly equipped and had poor communications, it was poorly led evidence? Source? In spite of all this, the Germans lost some 400 planes in the three days of the attack, 230 of them Junkers 52 thirds, the strategically essential transport for airborne infantry and paratroopers, a loss they would never replenish and which thwarted German plans for attacking England, Gibraltar and Malta with airborne forces. The Dutch forces succeeded in defeating the Germans in the first ever large-scale paratroop cum airborne attack in history, recapturing the three German-occupied airfields surrounding The Hague at the end of the first the day of the attack. Noteworthy were the privately financed but army-operated anti-aircraft guns, positioned on suspected approach routes that would overfly the industries that put up the money for them. The Dutch Army Cavalry, which had no operational tanks, deployed several squadrons of armoured cars, mainly near the strategical airfields. The German follow-up attacks overland were three-pronged Frisia Kornwerders and Gelderland Greb Line, Brabant Mordek, and were all stopped either fully or long enough to allow the Dutch Army to demolish the German airmobile divisions and mop up the lightly armed paratroopers and airborne troops around The Hague. This circumstance, together with the anti-aircraft guns, of which German intelligence had not been aware because they had been purchased by civilians, contributed to the failure of the German crack units of paratroopers and airborne infantry to capture the Dutch government and force a quick surrender. Instead, the Dutch government and Queen managed to escape so that the Germans only succeeded in imposing a partial surrender of the Netherlands. As a result, the Dutch state remained in the war as a combatant, immediately making its naval assets available for the joint Allied war effort, starting with the evacuation from Dunkirk. This is why during the Battle of Java Sea in 1941 the British, US and Australian navies could be led by a Dutch naval officer, Rear Admiral Carol Dorman. The major areas of intensive military resistance were the Hague and the area to the north of it, where the Dutch forces succeeded in decimating the two German airborne divisions that had been landed with the task of capturing the complete Dutch government. The hostilities are known as the Battle for the Hague. This totally unexpected setback led to panic in the German military leadership, which ordered the undefended city centre of Rotterdam to be wiped out see below in order to force an off-the-battlefield solution and stop the effective resistance by the Dutch forces. Before this terror bombardment, the Royal Netherlands Navy managed to ship some 1,300 captured German crack troops to England, providing their allies with first-hand intelligence about this novel type of airborne warfare. The Greb Line, a north-south line some 50 kilometres 31 miles east of the capital Amsterdam, from Amersfoort to the Wall, fortified, with field guns, and extensive inundations, the Dutch only surrendered after three days of hard and aggressive fighting, known as the Battle of the Grebeberg, with heavy losses on both sides. 
Having taken the Grebeberg, the German forces were confronted by the next setback. During the battle, the Old Hollandic Water Line, which was designed to make any incursion into Fortress Holland impossible, had been inundated and thus reactivated. Kornwerders and, with a bunker complex that defended the eastern end of the Offslutdijk connecting Friesland to North Holland and was held and until ordered to capitulate, Dutch army troops massacred wave after wave of German attackers, with support from the Royal Netherlands Navy cruising offshore on the North Sea. A small force of some 230 infantrymen stopped a complete German cavalry division in what became known as the Battle of the Offslutdijk. The exposed stretch of dam leading to the bunker complex became known among the Germans as Die Totenum https colon slash slash www.tro.nl slash home slash de dash besta dash stelling dash die dash we dash hadden tilde ad c21 slash Rotterdam, the bridges over the Wall River, where two school companies of Royal Netherlands Marines managed to keep a complete German army at bay until the bombardment of Rotterdam forced the commanding General Winkelmann to accept a partial surrender. Elsewhere, Dutch forces stayed in the war. In Europe, the fight continued from Zeeland, Battle of Zeeland, to Dunkirk, where a Dutch Royal Navy officer, Lodo van Hamel, assisted in the evacuation of Allied troops and was the last man to withdraw. Van Hamel was first to parachute back into the Netherlands a few months later, with the mission to set up the resistance in the Netherlands. He was captured, tried and executed. Dutch succeeded in stopping the German advance for four days. By that time, the Germans had already invaded some 70% of the country but failed to enter the urban areas to the west. The eastern provinces were relatively easy overrun because they had deliberately left lightly defended in order to create the necessary strategic depth. Adolf Hitler, who had expected the occupation to be completed in two hours sick, and maximally two days the invasion of Denmark in April 1940 had taken only one day, ordered Rotterdam to be annihilated to force a breakthrough as the attack was clearly failing on all fronts, leading to the Rotterdam Blitz on 14 May that destroyed much of the city centre and killed about 800 people, it also left some 85,000 homeless. Furthermore, the Germans threatened to destroy every other major historical city until the Dutch forces accepted capitulation. The Dutch military leadership, having lost the bulk of their air force, realized they could not stop the German bombers, but managed to negotiate a tactical capitulation instead of a national one, as would be the case with France a few weeks later. As a result, the Dutch state, unlike the French state, remained at war with Germany and the Germans' authorities had to ask every individual Dutch soldier to desist from further hostilities as a condition for their release from detention as a prisoner of war. The first act of resistance was therefore the refusal by members of the Dutch forces to sign any document to that effect. The 2,000 Dutch soldiers who died defending their country, together with at least 800 civilians who perished in the flames of Rotterdam, were the first victims of a Nazi occupation which was to last five years. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Initial German policy. The Nazis, who considered the Dutch to be fellow Aryans, were more manipulative in the Netherlands than in other occupied countries, which made the occupation seem mild, at least at first. The occupation was run by the German Nazi party rather than by the armed forces, which had terrible consequences for the Jewish citizens of the Netherlands. This was the case because the main goals of the Nazis were the Nazification of the populace, the creation of a large-scale aerial attack and defence system, and the integration of the Dutch economy into the German economy. As Rotterdam was already Germany's main port, it remained so and collaboration with the enemy was widespread. Since all government ministers had successfully evaded capture by the Germans, the secretaries general staying behind had no alternative but to carry on as best as possible under the new German rulers. The open terrain and dense population, the densest in Europe, made it difficult to conceal illegal activities contradicted above by the rather condescending claim that the Dutch seemed to be very good at hiding. Unlike for example, the Maquis in France, who had ample hiding places. Furthermore, the country was surrounded by German-controlled territory on all sides, offering few escape routes. The entire coast was forbidden territory for all Dutch people, which makes the phenomenon of Engelenvarder an even more remarkable act of resistance. The first German roundup of Jews in February 1941 led to the first general strike against the Germans in Europe and indeed one of only two such throughout occupied Europe, which shows that the general sentiment among the Dutch population was anti-German. If the Germans discovered people were involved in the resistance, they were often immediately jailed. 
It was the Social Democrats, Catholics, and Communists who started the resistance movement. Membership of an armed or military organized group could lead to prolonged stays in concentration camps, and after mid-1944, to summary execution as a result of Hitler's orders to shoot resistance members on sight, the Niedermachungsbefehl. The increasing attacks against Dutch fascists and Germans led to large-scale reprisals, often involving dozens, even hundreds of randomly chosen people who, if not executed, died after being deported. Most of the adult males in the village of Putten for example, which had 600 inhabitants, shared this fate. The Nazis deported the Jews to concentration and extermination camps, rationed food, and withheld food stamps as a punishment. They started large-scale fortifications along the coast and constructed some 30 airfields, paying with money they claimed from the National Bank at a rate of 100 million guilders a month the so-called costs of the occupation. They also forced adult males between 18 and 45 to work in German factories or on public work projects. In 1944 most trains were diverted to Germany, known as the Great Train Robberies, and in total, some 550,000 Dutch people were selected to be sent to Germany as forced labourers. Males over the age of 14 were deemed able to work and females over the age of 15. Over the next five years, as conditions became increasingly harsh and difficult, resistance became better organised and more forceful. The resistance managed to kill high-ranking Dutch officials, such as General Seyfart. In the Netherlands, the Germans managed to exterminate a relatively large proportion of the Jews. The main explanation that they were found so easily was that before the war, the Dutch authorities had required citizens to register their religion so that church taxes could be distributed among the various religious organizations. Furthermore, shortly after the Nazis took over the government, they demanded all Dutch public servants fill out an Aryan attestation, in which they were asked to state in detail their religious and ethnic ancestry. The American author Mark Klempner writes, Though there was some protest, not just from the government employees, but from several churches and universities, in the end, all but 20 of 240,000 Dutch civil servants dutifully sick, signed and returned the form. In addition, the country was occupied by the oppressive SS rather than the Wehrmacht as in the other Western European countries, as well as the fact that the occupying forces were generally under the command of Austrians who were keen to show that they were good Germans by implementing anti-Semitic policy. The Dutch public transport organization and the police collaborated to a large extent in the transportation of the Jews. Topic. Activities. On 25 February 1941, the Communist Party of the Netherlands called for a general strike, the February Strike, in response to the first Nazi raid on Amsterdam's Jewish population. The old Jewish quarter in Amsterdam had been cordoned off into a ghetto and as retaliation for a number of violent incidents that followed, 425 Jewish men were taken hostage by the Germans and eventually deported to extermination camps, just two surviving. Many citizens of Amsterdam, regardless of their political affiliation, joined in a mass protest against the deportation of Jewish-Dutch citizens. The next day, factories in Zondam, Harlem, Imuiden, Wiesp, Bussum, Hilversum and Utrecht joined in. The strike was largely put down within a day with German troops firing on unarmed crowds, killing nine people and wounding 24, as well as taking many prisoners. Due to this senseless violence against non-combative Dutch people albeit in support of the Jews, opposition to the German occupation intensified as a result. The only other general strike in Nazi-occupied Europe was the general strike in occupied Luxembourg in 1942. The Dutch struck four more times against the Germans, the students' strike in November 1940, the doctors' strike in 1942, the April to May strike in 1943 and the railway strike in 1944. The February strike was also unusual for the Dutch resistance, which was more covert. Resistance in the Netherlands initially took the form of small-scale, decentralized cells engaged in independent activities, mostly small-scale sabotage such as cutting phone lines, distributing anti-German leaflets or tearing down posters. Some small groups had no links with others. They produced forged ration cards and counterfeit money, collected intelligence, published underground papers such as De Warhide, Tro, Vry Nederland, and Het Parool. They also sabotaged phone lines and railways, produced maps, and distributed food and goods. 
One of the most popular activities was hiding and sheltering refugees and enemies of the Nazi regime, which included concealing Jewish families like that of Anne Frank, underground operatives, draft age Dutchmen, and, later in the war, Allied aircrew. Collectively, these people were known as underdikers, people in hiding, or literally, underdivers. Corrie ten Boom and her family were among those who successfully hid several Jews and resistance workers from the Nazis. The total amounted to over 300,000 people up to September 1944, tended to by some 60,000 to 200,000 landlords and carers. Amongst the other activities was printing. The local printers within Amsterdam made fake IDs from stolen plates, and members of the team stole official paper from the occupying Germans to make other documents necessary for those in hiding. Topic. Reprisals under Operation Silbertan After Hitler had approved Anton Mussert as Leiter van het Nederlands of Volk, leader of the Dutch people, in December 1942, he was allowed to form a national government institute, a Dutch shadow cabinet called Gemachtigden van den Leiter, which would advise Reichskommissar Arthur Seyss in court from 1 February 1943. The institute would consist of a number of deputies in charge of defined functions or departments within the administration. On the 4th of February, retired general and Reichskommissarius Hendrik Seyfart, already head of the Dutch SS volunteer group Vrijwilligerslegio in Nederland, was announced through the press as deputy for special services. As a result, the communist resistance group CS6 under Dr. Jarrett Kastein for their address, 6 Corelli Street, in Amsterdam, concluded that the new institute would eventually lead to a national socialist government, which would then introduce general conscription to enable the call-up of Dutch nationals for the Eastern Front. However, in reality, the Nazis only saw Mussert and the NSB as a useful Dutch tool to enable general cooperation and further Seyss in court had assured Mussert after his December 1942 meeting with Hitler that general conscription was not on the agenda. However, CS6 assessed that Seyfart was the first person within the new institute eligible for an attack, after the heavily guarded Mussert, after approval from the Dutch government in exile, on the evening of Friday 5 February 1943, after answering a knock at his front door in Scheveningen, Den Haag, Seyfart was shot twice by student Jan Verlund who had accompanied Dr. Kastein on the mission. A day later Seyfart succumbed to his injuries in hospital. A private military ceremony was arranged at the Binnenhof, attended by family and friends and with Mussert in attendance, after which Seyfart was cremated. On 7 February, CS6 shot fellow institute member Gemachtigde voor de Volksvorlichting attorney for the national relations H. Raiden and his wife. His wife died on the spot, while Raiden died on 24 August of his injuries. The gun used in this attack had been given to Dr. Kastein by Sitcherheitsdienst SD agent van der Waals, and after tracking him back through information, arrested him on 19 February. Two days later Dr. Kastein committed suicide so as not to give away Dutch resistance information under torture. Seyfart and Raiden's deaths led to massive Nazi Germany reprisals in the occupied Netherlands, under Operation Silbertan. SS General Hans Albin Rauter immediately ordered the murder of 50 Dutch hostages and a series of raids on Dutch universities. By accident the Dutch resistance had attacked Rauter's car on 6 March 1945, which in turn led to the killings at De Woest Hove, where 117 men were rounded up and executed at the site of the ambush and another 147 Gestapo prisoners were executed elsewhere. A similar war crime occurred on 1 to 2 October 1944 in the village of Putten where over 600 men were deported to camps to be killed in retaliation for resistance activity in the Putten raid. Topic: <laughs> England voyagers. A little more than 1700 Dutch people managed to escape to England and offered themselves to their Queen Wilhelmina for service against the Germans. They were called the Engelenvarders named after some 200 who had travelled by boat across the North Sea, most of the other 1,500 went across land. Some figures are especially noteworthy, Erik Hazelhoff Rolfzema, whose life was described in his book and made into a film and a musical sold at Van Orange, Peter Tazelaar and Bob or Bram van der Stok, who, after fighting air battles over the Netherlands during the initial German attack, managed to escape and who became a squadron leader in No. 322 Squadron RAF. Van der Stok's RAF Spitfire was shot down over France and he was taken prisoner by the Germans. 
Van der Stok became one of only three successful escapees of the Great Escape from Stalag Luft III, and the only one to succeed in returning to England to rejoin the fight as a fighter pilot. In the Hollywood movie, this pride of place is hijacked by a gung-ho American escapee who crosses the Swiss border on a motorbike. The reality of the war was soberer, no American was involved, and only the two Norwegians and the Dutchmen had the skills to escape and survive because they could speak German. For details, see the list of Allied airmen from the Great Escape. Topic. Radio A major role in keeping the Dutch resistance alive was played by the BBC, Radio Orange, the broadcasting service of the Dutch government in exile and Radio Herigen Nederland which broadcast from the southern part of the country during liberation. Listening to either program was forbidden and after about a year the Germans decided to confiscate all Dutch radio receivers. About half of all sets were taken, the rest went underground. With some listeners managing to replace their sets with homemade receivers. Surprisingly the authorities failed to outlaw the publication of magazine articles explaining how to build sets or the sale of the necessary materials until many months later. When they eventually did there were leaflets dropped from British planes containing instructions on building sets and directional aerials to circumvent German jamming. Topic. Press The Dutch managed to set up a remarkably large underground press that led to some 1,100 titles. Some of these were never more than hand-copied newsletters, while others were printed in larger runs and grew to become newspapers and magazines some of which still exist today, such as Tro, Het Parool, and Vrij Nederland. Organization As early as 15 May 1940, the day after the Dutch capitulation, the Communist Party of the Netherlands CPN held a meeting to organize their underground existence and resistance against the German occupiers. It was the first resistance organization in the country. As a result, some 2,000 communists were to lose their lives in torture rooms, concentration camps or by firing squad. On the same day Bernardus Ijazerdraat distributed leaflets protesting against the German occupation and called on the public to resist the Germans. This was the first public act of resistance. Ijazerdraat started to build an illegal resistance organization called De Guzen, named after a group who rebelled against Spanish occupation in the 16th century. A few months after the German invasion, a number of Revolutionary Socialist Workers Party RSAP members including Henk Snevliet formed the Marx-Lenin-Luxemburg Front. Its entire leadership was caught and executed in April 1942. The CPN and the RSAP were the only pre-war organizations that went underground and protested against the anti-Semitic action taken by the German occupiers. The most important resistance act, as said above, in the Netherlands was hiding and moving people. The first people who went into hiding were German Jews who had arrived in the Netherlands before 1940. They were not duped by the German attitude just after the Dutch capitulation. In the first weeks after the surrender, some British soldiers who could not get to Dunkirk Duinkirken, in French Flanders hid with farmers in Dutch Flanders. In the winter of 1940-1941 many French escaped prisoners of war POWs passed through the Netherlands. One single family in Oldenzaal helped 200 men. In total about 4,000 mainly French, some Belgian, Polish, Russian and Czech ex-POWs were aided on their way south in the province of Limburg. According to CIA historian Stuart Bentley, there were four major resistance organizations in the country by the middle of 1944, independent of each other. The low Landelijke Organisatie voor Hulp aan Onderdijkers. NL, or National Organization for Help to People in Hiding, it became the most successful illegal organization in Europe, set up in 1942 by Mrs. Helena Kuypers Rietberg aka Tant Riek Anti Riek and Fritz Slomp aka Fritz de Zwerver complete with its own illegal social services national stoon funds run by Walraven van Hall that paid a kind of dole on a regular basis throughout the war to all families in need, including relatives of sailors and hide ways. The LKP, Landelika Nachplog, or National Assault Group, literally translated, Brawl Crew, or Goon Squad, with about 750 members in the summer of 1944 conducting sabotage operations and occasional assassinations, the LKP provided many of the ration cards to the low through raids. 
Leendert Valstar Burdus, Jacques van der Horst Lewis's, and Hilbert van Dyck Ari organized local assault groups into the LKP in 1943. The RVV, Rod van Verzet, or Council of Resistance, engaged in sabotage, assassinations, and the protection of people in hiding. And the OD, Ord Dienst or Order of Service, a group preparing for the return of the exiled Dutch government and its subgroup the GDN Dutch Secret Service, the intelligence arm of the OD. CS6 Another, but more radical group was called CS6, it was probably named for the address where they were based, 6 Corelli Street in Amsterdam. According to Dutch official state war historian Dr. L. de Jong, they were by far the most deadly of the resistance groups, committing some 20 assassinations. Having been started in 1940 by the brothers Gideon and Jan Carroll Janka Boisevain, the group grew quickly to some 40 members and made contact with the Dutch communist and surgeon Dr. Jarrett Kastien. They targeted the highest-ranking Dutch collaborators and traitors, but duly became the victim of the most dangerous Dutch traitor and German spy, Anton van der Waals. Included in the list of their victims was the Dutch general Seyfart, who was used by the Germans to head the Dutch SS Legion. They also managed to assassinate an assistant minister, Raiden, and several police chiefs. CS6 are, according to de Jong, rightly recognized for their crucial role in the deportation of Jews and general terror and suppression. The planned assassination of the best-known Dutch traitor and collaborator, Dutch Nazi party leader Anton Mussert, was delayed and could never be accomplished. Their activities in eliminating Dutch collaborators prompted the 1943 covert murder reprisals by the Dutch SS. By 1944 treason and strain had decimated their ranks. <laughs> NSF In addition to these groups, the NSF Nationale Stun Fonds, or National Support Fund financial organization received money from the exiled government to fund operations of the LO and KP. It also set up large-scale scams involving the National Bank and the tax service that were never discovered. The principal figure of the NSF was the banker Walraven van Hall, whose activities were discovered by chance by the Nazis and who was shot at the age of 39. Because of Van Hall's work, the Dutch resistance was never short of money. Van Hall is considered to be the most important Dutch underground worker by national war historian Dr. L. de Jong. He finally got his monument in Amsterdam in September 2010. The number of people cared for by the Low in July 1944 is estimated to be between 200,000 and 350,000. That is one out of 40 inhabitants of the Netherlands, 1,671 members of the low LKP organizations lost their lives. Of the 12,000 to 14,000 participants in the low, 1,104 were killed or died in prison camps. 514 members of the LKP also died. The number of members of the LKP is rather precise 2,277, since their members were registered after the war. 2,277 was their number in September 1944. One third were members before this time. Only one of the top LKP members survived the war, Liepke Sheepstra a.k.a. Bob. Mrs. Helma Rietberg, one of the founders of the LO, was betrayed and died in Ravensbrück concentration camp. On the 22nd of September 1944, members of the LKP, RVV and a small number of the OD in the southern liberated part of the Netherlands became a Dutch army unit, the Stutrapen. This was during Operation Market Garden. Three battalions, without any military training, were formed in Brabant and three in Limburg. The 1st and 2nd Battalions from Brabant were involved in guarding the front line along the Wall and Meuse rivers with the British 2nd Army. The 3rd Battalion from Brabant was incorporated into a Polish formation of the Canadian 2nd Army on the front line on the islands of Thalin and St. Philipsland. The 2nd and 3rd Battalions from Limburg were included in the 9th American Army and were involved in guarding the front line from Roosteren to Aix-la-Chapelle during the Battle of the Bulge December 1944, they were repositioned on the line Aix-la-Chapelle to Liege Lewick. The 1st Battalion from Limburg was an occupational force in Germany in the area between Cologne Köln, Aix-la-Chapelle and the Dutch border. The 2nd and 3rd Battalions from Limburg accompanied the American push in March 1945 up to Magdeburg, Brunswick and Oscherslebin, which was deep into Germany. 
Women also served as typists and nurses. When the unit was brought into the regular Dutch army after the war, the women had to leave. Topic. Churches The Reformed churches and the Catholic churches joined together in resisting Nazi occupation. The Netherlands was about 48% Reformed churches and 36% Catholic churches at that time. Previous to the war the split between the Reformed churches and Catholic churches was profound. The resistance brought the churches together in their common struggle. In 1941, they jointly condemned the government's laws and actions. The churches became the conscience of the community. They formed ecumenical bonds that denounced antisemitism in all its forms. Many Catholic and Reformed churches became the center of resistance activities in all but name. The clergy also paid a high price. Forty-three Reformed clergy were killed and 46 Catholic priests lost their lives. Both denominations cooperated with many illegal organizations and made funds available, for instance, to save Jewish children. Many priests and ministers were arrested and deported, some died, such as Father Titus Brandsma, a professor of philosophy and an early outspoken critic of Nazism, who eventually succumbed to illness in Dachau concentration camp, and Father Raskin, a priest in the CICM missionaries, who operated under the codename Leopold Vindictive 200 and was beheaded by the Gestapo on 18 October 1943. Monsignor de Jung, Archbishop of Utrecht, was a steadfast leader of the Catholic community and a clear but wise opponent of the German occupiers. The Catholic stance on the protection of converted Jews, amongst others Edith Stein, a philosopher who was then also a nun in a Dutch convent, led to special prosecution of those Jews, Sister Stein being deported. After the war, captured documents showed that the Germans feared the role of the churches, especially when Catholics and Protestants worked together. After Normandy Following the Normandy invasion in June 1944, the Dutch civilian population was put under increasing pressure by Allied infiltration and the need for intelligence regarding the German military defensive buildup, the instability of German positions and active fighting. Portions of the country were liberated as part of the Allied drive to the Siegfried Line. The unsuccessful Allied Airborne Operation Market Garden liberated Eindhoven and Nijmegen, but the attempt to secure bridges and transport lines around Arnhem in mid-September failed, partly because British forces disregarded intelligence offered by the Dutch resistance toward German strength and position of enemy forces. The Battle of the Scheldt, aimed at opening the Belgian port of Antwerp, liberated the southwest Netherlands the following month. While the South was liberated, Amsterdam and the rest of the North remained under Nazi control until their official surrender on 5 May 1945. For these eight months, Allied forces held off, fearing huge civilian losses, and hoping for a rapid collapse of the German government. When the Dutch government in exile asked for a national railway strike as a resistance measures, the Nazis stopped food transports to the Western Netherlands, and this set the stage for the Hunger Winter, the Dutch famine of 1944. Some 374 Dutch resistance fighters are buried in the field of honour in the dunes around Blomondal. In total, some 2,000 Dutch resistance members were killed by the Germans. Their names are recorded in a memorial ledger Aureliste van Gevallen in 1940-1945, kept in the Dutch Parliament and available online since 2010. Topic. Main figures in the Dutch resistance Alphabetically ordered to the Dutch system with the IJ after the X, and adverbs not counted. Topic. See also Anti-fascism Dutch underground press History of the Jews in the Netherlands Military history of the Netherlands during World War II Regiment Stutropen Prins Bernhard Resistance during World War II the Netherlands in World War II The Resistance Banker Wachenberg Resistance Verzetsmuseum Winter in Wartime Topic. References Topic. Further reading Bentley, Stuart. The Dutch Resistance and the Ost 2012 excerpt and text search Bentley, Stuart. 
Orange Blood, Silver Wings, The Untold Story of the Dutch Resistance During Market Garden 2007 excerpt and text search Fisk, Mel, and Christina Raddick. Our Mother's War, A Biography of a Child of the Dutch Resistance 2007 excerpt and text search Van der Horst, Liesbeth. The Dutch Resistance Museum 2000 Shepman, Antoinette. Clouds, Episode of Dutch Wartime Resistance, 1940-45 Selin, Thorsten, ed. The Netherlands During German Occupation. Annals of the American Academy of Political and Social Science Vol. 245, May 1946 PPI-180 to in JSTOR Warmbrun, Werner. The Dutch Under German Occupation, 1940-1945 Stanford University Press, 1963 Dulf, Jeroen. Spirit of Resistance, Dutch Clandestine Literature During the Nazi Occupation Rochester, NY, Camden House, 2010. ISBN 978-1-57113-493-6 Mannheim, Jack. Memoirs of the Dutch Underground 1940-1945 Why me? England, UK, Amazon, 2017. 1 ISBN 1521902240 External links CIA paper on the Dutch resistance and the OSS Homepage of the Dutch Resistance Museum in Amsterdam Dutch Resistance Museum – History and Practical Information Discussion of the Netherlands under Nazi occupation On war atrocities in the Netherlands, some in revenge for resistance activities. A True Story of a Scout in Times of War, by Pete J. Kroonenberg at the Wayback Machine, archived the 23rd of July 2008. Jan de Hartig's speech given at Weber State College, his personal account of his participation in nonviolent Dutch resistance as an author. Verjetten Verzet in Nederlands Indie an account in Dutch of the forgotten resistance to the Japanese occupation of the East Indies.